When the Buddha says that suffering is clinging, he's basically saying that suffering is feeding. Now, for a lot of people, that's very counterintuitive. They would agree that if you're being fed upon, in other words, if you're the food, there would be suffering. But for a lot of us, that's the big pleasure in life. They say that people in concentration camps and prisoner of war camps get tired of talking about sex very quickly, but they can talk about food all the time. It gives them a lot of whatever pleasure they can find. But when you get in a situation where there's a lot of food insecurity, you begin to realize, yes, having to feed is a really precarious place to be. And this need to feed is what keeps that mind anxious. Where is the next meal coming from? Is it safe? Can you guarantee that it's going to be food? And as long as you feel secure about that, the mind is at ease. When you begin to realize that it's very tenuous, this network of systems that have to work in order to keep us fed, then you see the mind casting around. And as long as there's a possibility for some other source of food, it's going to keep on casting around. So when you have food security in terms of physical food, we have lots of food insecurity about metal food. Think of all the different kinds of clinging. There's clinging to sensuality, clinging to views usually about the world, clinging to ideas about how things should be done, and clinging to your sense of self. These are the things we feed on. And from this feeding, we create our states of becoming, the worlds of experience in which we move, where we're going to find our food, in the sense of what has to be done within those worlds, what opportunities they open, what opportunities they close. And as the Buddha pointed out, once you get to this stage in dependent core rising, you're suffering. because it's such a precarious place to be. So we have to get the mind more and more interested in finding the way out, having confidence that there is a way out, so that its thinking can go in that direction. Otherwise, its thinking is constantly around sources of food out there in the world, and also your ability to find them. You get a disease in the body, then the mind can very quickly go to, maybe it's fatal, maybe it's going to paralyze me, maybe it's going to do this, do that, make it impossible for me to feed the mind's desires for pleasures. This mind is constantly asking that question, what next, what next? It's a, it's a very anxious mind. And the only cure for that is to develop some confidence in the path. That the practice of generosity, the practice of virtue, the practice of meditation will feed you better. So look into these practices. To what extent are you not yet fully confident in them? And what can you do to develop more confidence? Turn your thinking in this direction. The Buddha talks about the different motivations that people have for giving, for example, and the different attitudes they take toward giving. In each case, they're talking to themselves. He, the passages in the Nepali quote 
things that people might be saying to themselves as they're giving. Starting with, I'm going to get this in the next lifetime, all the way up to giving makes the mind serene, giving is an ornament for the mind. In the sense of confidence, the sense of well-being will grow as you get to the higher and higher levels of motivation. The same with the attitude. You talk to yourself, there's, something's going to come of this, this generosity that I'm developing. You have to talk to yourself while you're doing these things to get the full benefit out of these practices. Because they're giving you training in what? Directed thought and evaluation. Turning your thinking to a positive direction. So you get more and more confident that even if the body begins to fall apart, or the social system outside begins to fall apart, things of real value are still there. Think about King Vicinity. When the Buddha asked him, suppose four mountains were moving in, one each from the four directions. And given that human life is so hard to come by, what would you do? And Vicinity had the good sense to say, what else can I do but Dharma practice, skillful practice? That's where your true security lies. Even though you're still feeding as you're on the path, you're feeding on something that's a lot more secure. So even when this body and this world, in other words the state of becoming you're in right now, begin to fall apart, you have the confidence that you've got something of value. The same with the precepts. You've got to talk to yourself, because there are times when it's going to be tempting to break the precepts. And you remind yourself of the good that comes from holding to your principles. The sense of well-being, the sense of self-esteem that comes. When you can look back on your actions and realize you didn't harm anybody. And even though you might have been able to get away with breaking the precepts, you said no. And as for the meditation, it gives you more pre precise practice and directed thought and evaluation. You're thinking about the breath. You're realizing if you really want to find the way out of here, this is where you look as you breathe in, as you breathe out. You're dealing with bodily fabrication. This is the one of the aspects of fabrication that come right after ignorance and dependent core rising. People often ask, where is the weak link in dependent core rising? Well, there, every link is a weak link if you look at it right, but the one that's immediately next to ignorance. If you want to see ignorance, look at how you're, you're breathing. Look at how you're talking to yourself about anything in the present moment, but particularly about the breath. Look at how you're developing perceptions and feelings through the way you associate with the breath, the perceptions you use to keep yourself with the breath. If these things are done in ignorance, they're going to lead to suffering. If they're done in knowledge, they're going to lead to the end of suffering. You want to be confident in that, because when the Buddha talks about Comparing the different aspects of the practice to different parts of a parts of a fortress. Concentration is the food. With concentration, you've got bodily fabrication, the breath, verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation again, and then mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. You put them all together in the right way, you've got good food inside. That's what provides the nourishment on the path. Give rise to. Feelings of pleasure, feelings of rapture, what John Lee calls the lubricant for the engine of the path. Once you can do these things in knowledge, then the knowledge begins to spread through all the other factors of dependent core rising. 
So the whole series becomes part of the path. Your acts of attention, your acts of intention, the way you relate to sensory contact. You're coming from a position where the mind is feeding on better food. So it doesn't, doesn't have to go out and feed in bits and scraps and go dumpster diving in the world. And you can relate to your body in a better way. You can relate to your thoughts in a better way. Because you're finding the food here, at the spot where the mind and the body meet with the breath. So there's less of a need to go feeding on those other things. And of course, there's always that worry that if you haven't gotten far enough along the path, What's going to happen to you when you die? And you have to remind yourself the only way you can guarantee something good is by focusing more and more and more on the path. So it is an act of will to change the way you talk to yourself. You can get people to be generous. But if they don't know how to talk to themselves about it, they can come up with all kinds of strange ideas. You can get them to observe the precepts, but again, they may resent it. They feel hemmed in by those rules. You can even get people to meditate and they talk to themselves in the wrong way. They start talking to themselves about how if they get the first jhana, here I have got the first jhana, and other people don't have the first jhana. The Buddha talks about this as a sign of a person of no integrity. So the simple practice of generosity, virtue, and meditation is not enough. You have to learn how to talk to yourself as you do it. Develop the right attitude. And if you find your mind sneaking off and getting worried about other things, you have to take it in hand and bring it back. Because it's been spending how many lifetimes worried about where the next meal is going to come from, both in terms of physical food and in mental food. That's why it's constantly asking deep down inside, what next, what next, what next, what do I have to watch out for next? So I have, you have the strength to practice generosity, virtue, and meditation. Apply that strength also to talk to yourself as you do this, to appreciate the goodness that can come from these things. You look at the Buddha's teachings and he gives you all kinds of examples for how to breathe, how to talk to yourself, what perceptions to hold in mind, even what feelings you should try to develop. Breath meditation. He says, develop feelings of pleasure, develop feelings of rapture. It's one of the big ironies about the way mindfulness is taught these days. Saying the Buddha said, well, just be with whatever, with whatever feeling comes up, whatever mind state comes up. He never says that. Consciously try to cultivate feelings of rapture and pleasure, cultivate mind states. that are gladdened, concentrated, released. It does require an act of will. To steer these things around. You see this when you look at the, the Pali word for ignorance. It doesn't mean only not knowing. It means lack of skill. Remember the Four Noble Truths, which are the knowledge that replaces ignorance, have their duties. And you can know that and just let it pass. Or you can know that and say, I'm going to take on those duties, an act of will. That requires that you talk to yourself about the dangers of not taking on the duties. It 
So here the Buddha is giving us examples of how we apply these different kinds of fabrication with skill, with knowledge. But as he said, he's the one who points the way, that's all. We're the ones who actually have to follow it. And we realize that part of this journey requires giving ourselves encouragement all along the way. His Dharma talks give us encouragement, they instruct us, they rouse us, they encourage, they urge us. And we have to learn how to do that for ourselves. So when you find yourself falling off to the side of the path, pick yourself up, dust yourself off. Remind yourself that this is a good path. As that chant says, Adi Galyana, Manje Galyana, Bariyosana Galyana. It's admirable in the beginning, admirable in the middle, admirable in the end. There's a good path all along the way. Whatever is required to make you want to follow it, talk to yourself in that way. And as long as the mind has energy to think, think in ways that are positive. Try to find food in being on the path. Let that be your nourishment. This is a source of food that once you get used to it and get skilled at it, you find it's a lot more secure. And so even though you're not all the way to the end of the path, a lot of your food insecurities can be put aside. <laughs>